hope the camera's set up right. Let's hope that we can... Mm. Hello everybody, it is of course me. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm kind of like reverting to type, going back to one of the old books that I read way back in the day, written by someone who started of writing uh, for the younger audience, is a little too intoxicating, and therefore I actually rather hate the way in which she writes. Uh, it is, of course, uh, that by him, an author who I developed a great deal of hatred for because obviously he's mad, quite, quite mad. But there's some little grains of interest, shall we say, which could possibly be, you know, that we could possibly look at this stuff and see whether there is something we can gain from it. It says here, in the straightforward or Protestant system of magic, there is very little to add in what has already been said. The magician addresses the direct petition to the being invoked, but the secret of success in the invocation has not hitherto been disclosed. So what he's trying to do is say he's got the answers. It is an exceedingly simple one. It is practically of no importance whatsoever that the invocation should be right, in inverted commas. There are a thousand different ways of com compassing the end pr or proposed as far as uh, external things are concerned. The whole secret may be summarized in these four words, and these are the four words I mentioned before, inflame thyself in praying. So he's focusing in on prayer itself as being the tool for all the states of consciousness. Right. Then, where's the other section I really wanted to have a look at? Here we go. I think it's page 130. One very effective method is to stop short by a supreme effort of will again and again on the very brink of that spasm, which means the moment that, you know, your eyeballs are rotated up into the head and you're, you know, you feel that there's some kind of divine energy going on around you. Until a time arrives when the idea of exercising that will fails to occur. So what he's saying there is the process here is quite lengthy and the operation of praying, okay, to the point of ecstasy needs to reach the point of, oh dear, no, 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 we're going to stop for a minute and then carry on, carry on, carry on until you get there again, uh, and then you've got to stop there again. And then you carry on again and again and again until such time as you reach a peak whereby, it says here, inhibition is no longer possible or even thinkable, and the whole being of the magician, no minutest atom saying nay, is, is irresistibly flung forth in a blinding light amid the roar of 10,000 thunders, the union of God and man is consummated. So from there, we've got this sense of when that moment comes, it's like there's a, and it's, you know, you can't control it. You know, you're, you're blown, you're being blown up somehow by this like spiritual experience. No minutest atom saying nay is irresistibly flung forth. So that's when you've got not a single part of your being which is going to stop you from having this amazing high brought about essentially by what he mentions earlier on, which is prayer and trying to make it so it is extreme. Uh, but then he then goes on and starts using some words which are useful in a blinding light. That's useful. Obviously, it's not visible light. It's just a question of the sensation of the energy coming out of you. It just feels like it's an explosion of light, which also connects very con closely to what Charles Cosmanio says in his books on psionics, when you know he he, he perceives the the energy of the the individual practicing the meditation to be expanding and expanding like a brilliant light, almost as if you're like a nuclear reactor, being you know giving off radiation like crazy. It's a sensation. It's a visualization. It's the uh, divine experience. But then the union of God and man is consummated. That's like going back to sort of like religious, occulty, magical type language, as if to say that when that moment comes, it feels like a divine experience. If the magician is still seen standing in the circle quietly pursuing his invocations, it is that all of the conscious part of him has become detached from the true ego, which lies behind the normal consciousness. So your true ego is like what I'm using right now. 
to talk to you. It's the normal day-to-day -day questioning. Have I done this right? Have I done that right? Have I put the washing on? What if, uh, what if I don't do this? And w what if I do this and it doesn't quite work out right? And all that kind of like complex human stuff. So the conscious part of him has become detached from the true ego. All right. So that's like the inner core star, so to speak, uh, expanding and exploding outside of your body, out of the conscious mind's control, out of thinking, well, am I doing this right? Have I put that together right? Have I used the right thing about to do this, that, and the other? Is that candle the right color? Oh, no, I don't really know anymore. All that kind of like stuff is just gone because you're just trying to blow yourself up. Again, what he says was with prayer, as if the key to a lot of magical work is essentially the power of prayer, but extended. Right. But he also goes on to say later in, uh, in that bit that one should be absorbing. Here we go, on page 139. After the ceremony has reached its climax, which is, you know, when you've like reached that point of saying that magical word or phrase or doing that action, which is part of the uh, sending your will out into the universe. Anticlimax must inevitably follow, but if the ceremony has been successful, this anticlimax is merely formal. The magician should rest permanently on the higher plane to which he has aspired. So I'm not quite sure what he's trying to say there, apart from the fact that you have changed in some way as a result of the experience. But then the whole force of the operation should be absorbed. So that's actually in written in bold type as if to say that's like a really, really important thing to do. There is almost certain to be a residuum since no operation is perfect. So instead of him just describing this as being a psychological exercise in which, uh, you know, you just have this wonderful religious high, you're feeling awesome, but there's something else going on there. He's discussing this as if there is extra spiritual energy which is left lying around. And somehow the operation of, you know, visualizing it coming back into you is somehow important. So, but there is almost a certain to be a residuum since the operation is perfect. And even if it were so, there would be a number of things sympathetic to the operation attracted to the circle. It's not really saying precisely what that's really about, though. So we're going to have to leave that one be. These must be duly dispersed or they will degenerate and become evil. Now, obviously, the idea of evil coming from a guy who was like a really hard drug user and like had Nazi ideas and was a real scum. OK, apart from the fact he was a good mountain climber uh, is obviously a bit hard to swallow. But what if there was a certain level of spiritual truth to this, that um, if you leave some like psychic energy floating around, spiritual healing energy floating around, and it suddenly is like separate from its intended purpose, and it therefore feels resentful and bitter, it might develop a consciousness of its own, and might come like into your dreams or into your consciousness and make you think, uh, you know, paranoid or negative thoughts, or do some, you know, do some damage to you psychologically. That's, that, that's possibly what he's talking about there. But it's still really hard to say. Right, now, moving on, he goes on to the talking about the body of light. Right, so which bit was I wanting to refer back to there? And he does mention that the astral body itself only sees things in accordance with its own nature. So, therefore, he says that you might be able to astral travel up above the roof, you won't necessarily see if it's raining or not, because the rain might not be of the order of things which that body at that time can actually talk about. One other thing I want to mention is he talks a lot about the rising of the planes, which uh, I've been struggling to work out what he's been talking about for a while, until I realized that the process of opening up the chakras in sequence is essentially just that. His visualization was that of imagining yourself like a rod, which is like doubling in length with various, uh, various different periods of time, which would be a way of suddenly feeling higher or slightly outside of yourself or slightly above yourself. So let's just think about that. 
on one side of things, he's talking about the rising of the planes as an important action prior to or during a magical operation, which could just be the opening of the chakras in the right order. And then he's talking about this fine body, which is he regards as being important to the operation itself, and perceiving things through the eyes of that subtle body. But he's also talking about this idea of this very explosive spiritual prayerful state, and therefore it seems to me as though he's talking about staying in that kind of like spiritual high with your intention set to, as it were, higher chakras or higher levels during the whole of the operation. And that in its own right seems to be from what he's talking about how one should be perceiving um, the various spirits and entities that you're dealing with when inside a magical circle. Develop the body of light until it's just as real to you as your other body. Teach it to travel to any desired symbol and uh, enable it to perform all necessary rites and invocations. In short, educate it. Which would connect with uh, what Silver Mundoon, uh, Silver Mundoon, Sylvan Muldoon said in the projection of the astral body when he was, he was trying to train his astral body to materialize in one particular place at one particular time through meditation, through walking to that place and doing, uh, and doing things which he would say would be what the astral body would do, go for a walk down that street and this, that and the other and, and command, as it were, his consciousness, his subconscious mind to make the astral body materialize in a particular place when he's about to do his particular journeys. Because a lot of the kind of like Goetia type stuff which he talks about, you know, the summoning of the spirits and torturing it and the rest of that, couldn't actually be possible unless you are being perpetually, during the whole nature of the operation, within that gamma state whereby spiritual things can come to the consciousness. And so it seems again that uh, prayer with intention to raise the consciousness to a higher level so that maybe third eye, a crown chakra and throat chakra are activated is what enables you to see during this particular special set apart time what's really happening there and to be able to maintain that state of consciousness, that state of prayer whilst engaging with perceived spiritual beings. This is another reason why I feel that essentially works of faith and works of religious devotion and especially works of prayer combined with things like the visualization of the chakras opening up and so on and so forth as well as the intentional prayerful creation of what the Wiccans call the working space, you know, the, the consecrated circle, which he talks about quite a lot, has its importance. Now, in most occult books, okay, let's just give for an example the instruction manual uh, for occult works which came with the occult tower. It focuses so much superstitiously upon um, how the altar should look and the right type of candles and all that stuff. It's therefore not focusing in on the inner journey. It's not focusing in on the development of prayerful states. Much of the stuff which you buy from certain particular sections of the bookshop and much of the words of people who are broadcasting about magic and witchcraft and occultism and spiritualism and the rest of that don't focus on the importance of learning and practicing different forms of meditation and especially prayer. This is a tragedy because it appears that when the prayerful state is sufficiently spiritually euphoric, that strange things can happen. It's still inappropriate, I believe, to turn around and use the phrase, it works, 
because then you're just telling people that you know you have all power you can cure them of their diseases by nine o'clock in the morning uh, and all of a sudden a win on the national lottery will suddenly come to you and you, you don't have to work for a living because you've got all the money from the lottery and but on the other hand you're still working your shitty little job and doing this that and the other okay but when we're looking at things from this point of view that prayer is the key and prayer is the state of mind that we should all be trying to learn and work towards when attempting to do anything strange it makes a lot more sense yes it would seem that the frequency of the brain could be a gamma frequency mixed with alpha somehow or something it's not the lower slower brainwave frequencies that we would normally associate with uh, you know, well, you know, your shamanic travel, journeying, visualization things. It is a high, uh, a high and heightened state of cognition. The gamma brainwave frequency is very quick and very rapid, so one can assume that lots of information could be processed, uh, processed in the brain by it, and that visual information can then uh, materialize in there. Maintaining that state of mind for a long period of time as is alluded to by this guy, is unbelievably tricky. It's not something which one can just walk into. Again, the, things like the instruction book from the Occult Tarot would suggest, yeah, just like set this up, light these candles and you'll be fine, you'll be fine. Find yourself a, you know, the, you know your, your average person of various different theological persuasion, you just say, well, we just follow the tradition and the tradition does it all. Now, it could be the people who do uh, believe very heavily in the tradition could be going through what Crowley suggests that you know the the operation itself the, the candles the incense the this that and the other somehow excites the operator but it doesn't mean to say that the tradition is what's important okay to me the secret which is alluded to also by Alphonse Louis Constant in Transcendental Magic is essentially the work of faith, the work of prayer, and the work of uh, a good understanding of how to get into that state of mind and to maintain it for a period of time which is sufficient to do something. I still see this as being an experimental art form um, and not necessarily hard and fast and clear cut. However, uh, when, I'm doing for my, when I'm doing tarot readings for myself, and yes I do that, I don't just all lay out some cards and this, that, and the other. No. Because whatever turns out in the car, in physically in the cards is one thing, but it's the intuition which is what you should really be listening to. And I have had times when opening up the chakras in sequence and, and, reach, and opening up the crown chakra, and then asking what appears to be, uh, you know, the conscious energy, the guides, or whatever it is, a particular question. Sometimes a feeling of an answer would come down to me. Uh, and sometimes it would even be in words, not heard but the meanings of those words being trickled into the top of my head, um, which is, of course, weird. But there's, but that seems to be um, possibly how one could establish genuine contact with either higher conscience or God or spiritual beings or entities or whatever it is that's up there. But remember, it's that sense of rising slowly to the, you know, the higher power, the divine, the God, the, the whatever. Uh, and the fact it's done prayerfully, which appears to be the thing which opens you up to spirit. And I could go into deeper discussion about this, but this is a YouTube video and you've probably got dinner to make and all kinds of other things. And you're worried about your shopping list and um, whether your boyfriend and or girlfriend really likes you and all that kind of stuff. So I'll let you get on with your life. But think about what I've said here. All right. It's not what the chaos magicians would call a state of gnosis, which is the thing which helps things to work. It is, in fact, the state of mind of prayer, because magic itself if it exists at all, is a extended form of religious activity. Um, yeah, there is, there is more that I could say. Some of it I don't think I could broadcast on YouTube about that. Uh, 
but also remember for those of you who are young adolescent or cultists out there when people say that you know just autoerotic activity combined with staring as a sigil or whatever is going to do things for you tell the people who told you that to go and find someone else to talk to okay because no all right the, the, the key the secret the mystery is that of the prayerful state of mind and learning how to bring it about okay nick dutch out for now <laughs>